We think differently. Morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have a special guest today. Uh, but uh, let me firstly apologize uh, uh, on behalf of our rector who had um, urgent call and who was unable to be together with us this morning. But I will read uh, his uh, welcome note right now before uh, uh, chairing our special guest for today. So on behalf of uh, uh, the rector, uh, let me read uh, uh, this short uh, uh, warm welcome to Excellency President of Republic of Malta. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is a great honor for me to address you this morning at yet another round of Geneva Lecture Series, Contemporary World of Geoeconomics. Today is a truly special occasion. After so many notable guests, including the Nobel Prize laureates, we do host an incumbent or serving president of one European and EU state for the first time. Let me warmly welcome His Excellency Dr. George Vela, President of Republic of Malta. Republic of Malta is a meeting point of civilizations, races, languages, religions, and cultures of tradition and of modernity. Country's meaning, reputation, and position is well beyond its physical size. Malta is European, it's also island, and it's Mediterranean country, yet it's at the very gate of Afro-Asia. Country is enriched by fascinating layers of millennial history, or better to say histories, but also with a clear dynamic and vibrant promise of inclusive and sustainable tomorrow for all generations of Maltese and of Europeans. Hence, Malta is a journey, but it is also a desired destination too. Excellency President, on behalf of our fellow students and professors in all our campuses and our associates, guests and Geneva-based diplomats, let me thank you so much for accepting our call this morning and for honor to be with us today. Before I'm giving the word to you, our uh, assistant Isabel Bello will read shortly your biography for those, although we distributed, for those who are joining us right now. So Isabel, it's you. Thank you, Professor. Dr. George Pella is the 10th president of the Republic of Malta by virtue of a parliamentary resolution passed on the 7th of March in 2019 by the House of Representatives. President Bella was born on the 24th of April in 1942. His educational path commenced at the Sejun Primary School, followed by a secondary education at the De La Salle College in Berlin. In 2018, he was identified by the Secretary General of the Commonwealth as one of the eight eminent persons from the Commonwealth to prepare a report on the governance of the Commonwealth Secretariat. Dr. George Fella has been decorated with Companion of Honor of the National Order of Merit in Malta, Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in the United Kingdom, Grand Croce Prometo Militense of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, Cavaliere di Gran Croce dell'Ordine di Santa Gata in San Marino and Grand Commander de l'Or de l'Honneur in the Hellenic Republic. He is married to Miriam and has three children, Claire, Elaine, George Jr. and seven grandchildren. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, President of Republic of Malta, Dr. George Vela, Excellency, Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anis. Thank you, Professor Perovelli, for the second introduction, my director, academic staff, dear students. I am very thankful for this invitation from the UMEF University of Geneva campus to address you today on an issue of fundamental importance to my country. Developments in the Mediterranean are not only more to concern, they should be everyone's. The repercussions go well beyond the geographical border extending of this region is something that will help you, young citizens of the globe, to better appreciate the complexities and the richness of this historic basin that have contributed so much to humanity. So the first start by describing the setting, the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean as a region. 
When we speak of Mediterranean, we often, perhaps unknowingly, commit the mistake of projecting this as a homogeneous, uniform region. This is not the case. One can partially attribute the lack of success of certain policies because we forget about the regional dynamics and continuously changing realities of this region. The closest we can get to a focused assessment of development in the Mediterranean is by breaking them down into the Western, the Central, and the Eastern perspectives. The Western dimensions broadly related to the Euro-Mediterranean. There are vertical issues affecting the Northern European partners and the Southern partners in the Maghreb. Certain Mediterranean challenges with which Malta is all too familiar concern primarily the legal migration transit route as well as the instability in Libya. These two issues run front and center of Malta's foreign policy. On the Eastern Mediterranean flank, we are witnessing the terrible events taking place between Israel and Palestine. Instability in important countries like Lebanon and huge commercial interests in oil and gas exploration and exploitation between Israel, <coughs> Greece, Egypt, Turkey, and Cyprus. We are also seeing increasing instability as a result of planned drilling activities in contested maritime borders. Then there is also the long-standing separate question, which goes back to 1974, not to mention development in the Western Balkans. I will come back with my thoughts on the Middle East peace process in greater detail very shortly. Let us talk about hard security. This would be either military or political. <coughs> Thankfully, there are no military threats to security in the region apart from the fighting, which I have already made reference to between Israel and Palestine. I will try to be as succinct as possible in going to the most pressing, hard security hotspots in the Mediterranean from a political perspective. Let me start off with a very close neighbor of Volga, which is India. Over the past decade, the threat emerged from a possible return to a military dictatorship and inability to control migration. For years, the main two factions in Tripoli, the Sarraj government, and in Benghazi, General Haftar, have come close to open confrontation on who is to lead the country. <clears throat> this resulted in a considerable hardship for the Libyan population, for the general, creating general instability in North Africa as well, as in the Sahel, and difficulties in controlling the flow of irregular migration transiting in Libya and reaching Europe. Following several comings and goings, meetings and conferences, lives lost, and constant bedding by external regional players for their own gains, we are now looking at the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. The newly established Libyan government should lead the transition for elections, hopefully by the close of this year, round about December 24th. There are many questions to be answered on the credibility of this time frame and on the structure that would, allow the, that would allow these elections to take place. Yet there is an element of hope which we were close to losing on so many occasions. In my view, the international community could have done much more for Libya. The United Nations has admittedly saved the day through careful and patient negotiations. But we should think of a more visible and hands-on stabilizing presence of the United Nations in the country. <coughs> the same applies to the European Union. Now is the time to actively engage with all Libyan stakeholders and all members of the international community to show strong resolve in supporting the transitional leadership. We cannot lose this chance. Now that rather lately the European Union seems to be working on this dossier in religion. Ensuring timely preparation for the national elections should now be our main priority. This includes the adoption of necessary electoral laws, laws and its constitutional basis. 
the reforms that are going to happen in Libya. And I was saying that uh, ensuring timely preparation for the national elections should now be our main priority. This includes the adoption of necessary electoral laws and its constitutional basis. The concrete implementation of all provisions of the October ceasefire agreement and the necessary economic reforms starting with the unification of all financial institutions, including the National Oil Corporation and the Central Bank of Libya. These were all inspired from the outcomes of the Berlin Declaration and the agreement reached by the Libyan political dialogue front. I'm pleased to see that the European Union has started, that stated it will be ready to support this process in one of its latest statements. And I now hope to see this commitment translated into concrete action. Against this backdrop, Malta continues to take the lead, as it has over these last 10 years, to sensitize the international community to Libya's needs, as well as to urge all Libyan parties to come round the same table in a spirit of dialogue. I had the occasion of reiterating Malta's support to Libya and its people only a few days ago, when I had the opportunity of meeting with the new Minister for Foreign Affairs, Nail al Mangush, also the first women foreign minister ever in Libya. Another evident turbulent dossier in the region is that about the Middle East peace process, or whatever remains of it. I say this because there is definitely no peace and hardly any process to achieve it to speak of. Events in East Jerusalem, which has also taken over the West Bank, Gaza, and parts of Israel, are deeply troubling, and I would say shocking. It's hard to believe that after more than 70 years of negotiations, we have not arrived anywhere. This recent escalation has brought fear and additional hardship to the populations involved and risks that further escalation will bring about destabilization of a much larger, already volatile region. This is not the time for repetitive, weak statements that are of no substance and are shelved in the bottom drawer. Unilateral and intentional acts that originally triggered these developments must be outrightly condemned. This includes firing of rockets, as well as the disproportionate use of force that is taking the lives of civilians going about their daily lives, especially innocent children. I ask what the international community will do to de-escalate the situation. Will the United Nations Security Council be paralyzed by a veto to even at least issue a statement, let alone act? What about the quartet format composed of the United States, Russia, and the European Union and the United Nations? Will it remain dormant as it has over the past years? Why, is, why this inertia while people are dying every day? Aside from Libya and Israel and Palestinian question, there are several other hard security issues that stand in the way of Mediterranean stability. In the Maghreb region, there is still the Western Sahara issue, which has remained unresolved with a latent potential, potential for conflict at any moment. The future of Algeria and the post Bouteflika period remains hazy, while a constitutional crisis could be emerging in Tunisia. Moving eastwards to the Mashrek, the scent continues to prevail in Egypt, and Lebanon is plagued by government instability, protests, and bankruptcy. Syria, as we all know, has endured a 10-year devastating war, which leaves it as it was when it all started, still under the regime of Assad, millions of displaced persons, and a fragmented country. I mentioned earlier the concept of neighbors of the neighbors, which in the case of Malta and the European Union leads us to talk about the Gulf countries, the Sahel and Africa more broadly. Here too, the scenario is far from rosy. In Yemen, for example, we remained passive in the face of the worst humanitarian crisis in decades. I find it disturbing that we so very few speak up for an intervention for humanitarian purposes 
or even condemn the aggression that left tens of thousands of people dead. It would appear that major countries were more interested, and I hate to say this, in arms sales and keeping good political relations with whoever is subsidizing this war, rather than with taking a principled international stance to achieve peace. There is little doubt in my mind that Yemen is yet another case of double standards in the international arena. The end results are deaths of civilians, humanitarian crisis, displaced populations, and more violence and more hatred. Gulf without mentioning Iran. The unilateral withdrawal of the United States under the Trump administration from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as the Iran nuclear deal, was a hard blow to the process. I welcome the willingness of the new United States administration to return to the deal and hope that the ongoing intense diplomatic efforts will bring about positive results. The international community needs to preserve this deal and ensure its full implementation. In the Sahel, we have we had the recent death of President Debi of Chad and the installation of an 18-month military civilian regime by his son before elections are held. My question is, will this regime keep the peace? Apart from Chad, then there is also the instability in Mali and the migrants coming up from Niger and Nigeria, running away from terrorist organizations like Boko Haram. Africa definitely holds a bearing on stability in the Mediterranean. I have long said, stated that Africa needs to be assessed in a comprehensive manner and not merely from the angle of irregular migration. There is ample room for the promotion of peace and stability on the continent, and I hope to see increased support to African efforts, such as the African, the African peace and security architecture. Pressing threats to stability such as terrorism, violent extremism, maritime crime and piracy, the illicit flow of armaments, trafficking and forced displacement of persons required a collective effort by the United Nations, the European Union, and the African Union. The next biggest security challenge in the Mediterranean is the production, the procurement, and the distribution of light arms and small, small weapons and ammunition. This is a central issue that deserves increased international attention, not only in the region, but also worldwide. The pity is that those major powers that are normally expected to exercise control are themselves major producers and suppliers, with economies depending heavily on this trade in arms. There is an evident need for disarmament and for strict and credible controls on the sale and provision of small arms, light weapons and ammunition. The proliferation of small arms and light weapons leads only to conflict, displaced civilian populations, death of innocent persons, while creating general instability and humanitarian crisis. These are referred to as hard security threats, but the so-called soft security threats are equally as disruptive of global peace and security. <coughs> soft security, while of a different, perhaps more subtle nature, is equally dangerous to the Mediterranean. Let's start with migration and human trafficking. The Mediterranean has been marked by this phenomenon for years now. Malta is mostly affected by movements on the central Mediterranean route, that is sub-Saharan migrants transiting through the desert, then into Libya, where then they try to cross to Europe. Malta has often been left alone to address these pressing realities with other frontline countries like Italy, Greece, and Spain. All together calling for increased and tangible solidarity from other European Union member states, which I have to say, however, up to now has not materialized. Then there is organized crime, illegal trafficking of drugs, contraband and oil, etc. International and transnational crime perpetrated 
by organized criminal groups constitute a considerable threat to the Mediterranean region. It regrettably continues to thrive in countries with weak structures and limited economic opportunities for the, for the population to engage in. Activities in our region range from drug trafficking, people smuggling, money laundering, counterfeit goods, to even supporting terrorist groups, impinging therefore directly on the safety of the populations involved and also the economies of the riparian states. These challenges know no boundaries and no borders, and we therefore need to tackle them together and not in isolation. Then there is terrorism and extremism. The Mediterranean region, like several others, is affected by violent extremism. For a durable and effective strategy, we need to look at the specificities of violent extremism today and work on strategies to counter the phenomenon and its root causes. We also have to, to embark on a deeper analysis of interactions between violent extremism and other phenomena such as populism, which has been revived in European countries and which in my view poses an imminent threat to the values upon which the European Union is founded. We also have inequalities and economic disparities between the North and the South of the Mediterranean. Southern Mediterranean countries continue to struggle with serious socio-economic issues and challenges. Unemployment remains high, especially for youths, leaving them feeling helpless and frustrated. This creates serious risks of social and political instability in the entire region. Economic and governance reforms are required to counter high youth unemployment, poverty, low quality education, underdeveloped infrastructure and poor business opportunities. Very importantly, there needs to emerge a sound and attractive investment climate based on functioning and accountable institutions. It is crucial to ensure that these reforms need to be owned by the countries in question and not in any way imposed from the outside. Youth have to be given education opportunities and be encouraged to help in the development of their countries. We must avoid at all costs brain drains. There are also horizontal issues posing threats to our shared region, which I will briefly touch upon to give you a broad idea of how complex this scenario of security is. Let's begin with climate change, which is putting even more pressures on the resources we depend on, increasing risks associated with disasters such as droughts, rising temperatures, desertification, and rising sea levels. Rural populations are increasingly facing water shortages and crop failure, and thus are forced to migrate in search of better opportunities. This is in turn, this in turn is contributing to the swelling numbers of desperate people willing to cross deserts and seas in search of a better quality of life. Very closely linked to climate change is the preservation and protection of the marine environment. In spite of the achievements of the past decade, considerable challenges must still be tackled to ensure the environmental protection of the Mediterranean region and the sustainable and balanced development of the countries on the littoral. Coastal areas and wildlife are still threatened by unsustainable development and uncontrolled pollution, such as from unprocessed sewage and from oil and toxin discharges, bilge and ballast washings from tankers, intend unintended spillages during loading, unloading and transportation of oil, as well as from the occasional disaster resulting in spillages of hydrocarbons and other toxic substances. Biodiversity is threatened by invasive species and scraping of the seabed. Uncontrolled fisheries also in many countries are also endangering wildlife. Besides the growth of maritime traffic 
and the huge amounts of oil shipped in the Mediterranean might also significantly increase the level of related risk for the marine environment. In order to address the wide range of challenges, there has to be a comprehensive strategy that is also effective on the ground and with the population. In this regard, I welcome the launch of a new European Union agenda for the Mediterranean, which clearly states that a strengthened Mediterranean partnership remains a strategic imperative for the European Union. Let me remind you that this is happening 25 years after the Barcelona Declaration and a full 10 years after the Arab Spring that challenged the whole of the Mediterranean. Without being too critical, I have to point out that sadly, some proposals have been repeatedly talked about for many years and proved to be non-starters. We have heard the calls for greater security, stability and prosperity in the Mediterranean. We heard this innumerable times, both on a bilateral basis and during multilateral conferences on the region. These statements, as well-meaning as they may have been, have not yielded the desired results. I mentioned by way of example, the reproposal, proposing again of a deep and comprehensive free trade area of the Mediterranean. Let's remind everybody that this was attempted years ago with a poor result due to a serious lack of change in free trade, especially free lack of exchange in free trade, especially between the North African countries that were members of this partnership before the European Union, between the European Union and the Southern Neighborhood. This document is full of interesting proposals with goals that we will agree, easily agree, would be ideal if we manage to achieve them, but that we know from experience that these are just wonderful hopes and that there is little chance of achieving them. Ideally, we turn these goals from, from words to do and documents to facts that can benefit the citizens of these countries. It is ironic to read in this document about tackling migration without admitting that the EU, EU member states have up to now no unified policy on this phenomenon. Ultimately, what is important is what actually gets implemented and not just what is written in agreements and documents. Let me now move on to the role that Malta has traditionally played in addressing the manifold threats to security in the Mediterranean. Malta has been a passionate and persistent proponent of Mediterranean security for many, many years. Mediterranean multilateralism is one of the strongest characteristics of Malta's foreign policy, including the parliamentary dimension and contribution to international affairs. Our long-standing vocation for dialogue and peace goes back to the 1975 Helsinki Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, at the time known as the Organization on Security and Cooperation in Europe. On that occasion, it was upon Malta's insistence that European leaders realized the validity of dialogue with southern parts and the imperative need to include the Mediterranean chapter in the final act of the OSC. I underline the importance of the various regional and sub-regional initiatives in the Mediterranean, which provide fertile ground of ideas and allow for a frank exchange of views amongst the various partners involved. The Union for the Mediterranean, for one, presents an ideal platform for regional cooperation in the Mediterranean, whilst complementing the bilateral relations that exist between the European Union member states and countries of the southern neighborhood. A twinning formula was a project-based project approach to capacity building, to business and infrastructure, energy and climate action, and social and civil affairs. Malta has seconded a special envoy first and now a deputy secretary general responsible at UMF for social and civil affairs. The Annaland Foundation, based in Alexandria and Egypt, is another tangible example of the firm commitment which exists in the region 
to the enhancement of multiculturalism and interfaith dialogue. I had the pleasure to host the third Underland Foundation Mediterranean Forum, which took place in October 2016. The forum brought together over 600 young people from across the Mediterranean region, making it quite unique in its, in its format. On a horizontal level, Malta actively supports and participates in a number of other Mediterranean fora, such as the 5 plus 5 dialogue and the European Union Med7 group. Such initiatives complement each other and still remain very relevant today as they further promote dialogue and confidence building measures. <clears throat> Relations between the European Union and the League of Arab States should continue to develop. The geographic proximity of our two regions and the emerging issues of common concern require deeper engagement. This organized structured dialogue, which culminates regularly into ministerial meetings as well as summits at head of government levels, has come to be known as the Malta Initiative. Since 2009, Malta hosts the European Commission League of Arab States Liaison Office. I also wish to add that the Mediterranean is a perfect laboratory for parliamentary diplomacy. As we can see, the problems are not lacking and we are waiting for solutions. The parliamentary dimension can play a very fundamental role in finding them, or at least some of them. I have to say that parliamentary structures are not lacking in the Mediterranean. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, there are too many of them. And this brings along repetition, overlapping, and wastage of human and intellectual resources. Let me briefly conclude by mentioning the initiatives that my presidency is taking to address security challenges through dialogue. In all my meetings with foreign interlocutors, my message is always a consistent one, consistent one, based on the need to speak and to listen to one another and to keep avenue, avenues of communications open. Closing the door to dialogue, no matter how serious the rift may be, is never the solution. Positions become entrenched and the farther away one goes, the more difficult it becomes to resume contact. In delivering this message, my presidency takes part in initiatives involving a range of educational or cultural bodies, regional and international, to put the message forward. The Global Council for Tolerance and Peace, which has a seat in Malta, as well as the al Cultural Foundation, based in Kuwait, are two such examples. I will, in fact, be hosting an international forum on leadership for peace organized by the letter COVID permitting later on this year. The Global Counterterrorism Forum, whose Institute for the Justice and Rule of Law is hosted in Malta, is another entity through which I have regularly conveyed my thoughts on how to address security issues in the Mediterranean. On the academic front, my office works in very close cooperation with the Mediterranean Academy for Diplomatic Studies. This is a very important institution in Malta as it trains young diplomats from the Mediterranean and beyond in a culture of mutual understanding and a cross-cultural environment. It would be very interesting for you, MEF Geneva, to establish contact with this academy and think of ideas on possible future collaboration at both the institutional and student-to-student -student levels. I conclude by wishing you every success in your studies and hope that despite the difficulties brought about by the COVID pandemic, you will be able to enjoy what remains of the current scholastic year. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Excellency <clears throat> President, thank you so much. It was great uh, and uh, really comprehensive talk and I'm sure that uh, many questions are just about to come. I'm particularly happy that you ended up with a cross-generational contract because you, you, you mentioned brilliantly, uh, um, uh, you tackled all, all issues and the open problems. And uh, what I uh, also liked is actually that you said that uh, many of the issues are just talked over and over, but they are not, uh, as you said, no, 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 no fly-ons or no startups. 
Uh, Cross-generational contact, of course, is a, is a, is a worry of, uh, of young generation. And I would just remind our audience that there are links between Switzerland and, and Malta. And I had the pleasure some even two decades ago to be uh, at the Academy at one of the international conferences. And uh, Maltese are really good hosts, good organizers, and that's a brilliant place to be. Um, uh, what also uh, should be maybe mentioned uh, to the audience is that Malta is also the champion of so-called dialogue between the uh, island and small states, which are far beyond Europe. Actually, Malta is nearly the only, I, I, I'm not sure if, if uh, Cyprus is there, but uh, practically Malta is the only European. So that gives, that gives the projection to Malta, to the small Carib uh, uh, Caribbean states, to small Pacific uh, states, and um, uh, coming back to, to my visit in Malta, I met people that I would uh, uh, practically have never met uh, 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 other than in Geneva UN or uh, in the New York UN, uh, people from Tuvala and from other um, uh, uh, Micronesian states, which were coming to Malta. And for, my, for them, actually, Malta represented an important, an, an important place, an important uh, forum also to address issues of the small and island states. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, we have on the count uh, some 80 participants, but many due to the, let's say the restrictions of Zoom, many are actually participating in class. So ba basically the number is several hundreds of people who are observing this morning uh, your talk. President, uh, President uh, uh, Mr. President, thank you so much. I would now open the floor to your questions. I would ask administrator to unmute uh, people. You raise simply hand, try to uh, be brief and concise with your question. Yes, please. Uh, Mr. President, you take three questions or one by one? Well, I think we'd rather take three questions and then answer the two. Okay, questions. okay. So if first three related, questions. They are related, obviously. <laughs> yes. Uh, first three questions, please be concise. Thank you very much, His Excellency. I am Abdurrahim Saidi, the CEO from Dunya University in Afghanistan. I have two questions, one, one on Afghanistan or about Afghanistan and one on uh, Middle East, particularly the recent escalation between Palestine and Israel. The first one uh, on Afghanistan, His Excellency, you have not, of course, in your presentation indicated any clue about this uh, withdrawal of international military uh, military forces from Afghanistan. But I want to raise that if, uh, of course, uh, we, we have noticed from your presentation that if there, there, there is still a lot of security concerns in different parts of the world, and of course, any uh, security issue in any part of the country, uh, any part of the world that matters for others as well. So if if this international community, they are withdrawing their military forces, particularly US and European countries, if proper and, and, and the peace process is also still at doubt, it is not moving in the right direction. So if they are not taking a proper uh, arrangement politically and economically here, so how you see the future of development of Afghanistan in our region. Uh, and also with regard to Gaza and Palestine, still it seems that, of course, you have indicated some very good points, but you see still you have rightly said that just condemning is not enough and it is not appropriate, but it seems that it is still for the nearly two weeks, it is going with, the, with further escalation and still there is no measure steps taken to stop this violence or this uh, war. So how you, do you see it? Do you see that it may be escalated further or in, in the coming one or two weeks, it's, uh, there would be some intervention by international community to, to stop this, this, uh, this uh, uh, fragile war? Thank you very much. Thank you. The second question. Hello. Uh, good morning, uh, Excellency. I had the pleasure. Michael. Professor Anis, Robert Lanka. 
Yes, yes, please, please, please. Okay. okay. Please. Uh, I am Mubia Lanka. I'm the director of SARSIO, the uh, research center of uh, UMEF. I was a long time ago uh, the tourist coordinator of the Blue Plan and uh, the uh, Mediterranean Action Plan. I had the pleasure to meet you uh, in, in a meeting, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember me. Uh, my, my question is, is this one. You're, you are very lucid concerning the climate change. Okay, yes. really what you say is perfect. Now, why I am uh, worried is about the future of tourism in the Mediterranean area. Malta is the center hub for tourism and can, what can you do uh, to, uh, to, to join these two concepts of uh, tourist development and uh, um, trying to adapt the, your country and the Mediterranean to the climate change. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So we have three questions. Af Afghanistan, uh, Excellency, Afghanistan, the Middle East, is it beyond control? And, uh, and the third is tourism linked with the, with the climate change. Okay, if I properly understood. With a question um, put by, by Abdul about, about Afghanistan. I have to say that obviously um, we didn't make any reference to that part of the world because we're talking about the Mediterranean. However, I do understand and I do sympathize um, with his concerns because we speak a lot about Israel-Palestine relations and we speak about other regions and, and that region, um, Afghanistan, um, we all know that has been um, in the news for, I would say, wrong reasons all the time um, for so many years. The issue is whether withdrawal of foreign troops at the moment would be in the best interest of Afghanistan or not. This is a question which obviously has to be debated by academicians, has to be debated by politicians, and there's, there have to be people who are in the know and who know exactly what conditions they are talking about and what are the options? What would happen if the troops stay? What would happen if the troops are withdrawn? And even if, it, if the troops are withdrawn, at what rate are they withdrawn before they find, before somebody finds the right balance to see that withdrawal of troops does not mean, you know, reigniting uh, issues and, and wars and, and um, instability. So that is something which um, I'm not an expert on to, to, to admit. However, uh, we all know that this has been, as I said, it's been all these years. Now, hopefully, if there is prudent agreements and, and um, you know, gradual reduction in foreign presence, things might stay, might stay stable. As far as Gaza and Palestine are concerned, obviously, one well, we have to be careful how to speak on this because, admittedly, we have to condemn things that are wrong on both sides. I cannot condone the firing of missiles. I cannot condone the extraordinary measures taken to make up for that. I cannot condone the evacuation of people. I cannot condone keeping um, uh, people from, from going to the holy sites. I mean, it's, it's a whole mixture of things which makes it difficult where to start from. Admittedly, there's a whole complex of issues where if we simply condemn, it's not enough. And if we say, let's go back to the negotiating table, we've been at the negotiating table for 70 years and nothing happened. So if one were to ask what can happen, it's very difficult, very difficult to say. I had the opportunity to be in Gaza twice, 2009, after um, cast led and again later on. And I can tell you that it's traumatic. When one is on site and speaks to the people who have been affected, now whether they are, whether they are, they are in right doing, you know, it's, it's within their right or, or, or wrong. I'm talking about civilian population in Gaza. Then there are also the civilians in the occupied territories. There is the very important interest of the Israelis to ensure their security. These are all issues which, which have to be put into the, into the basket. And there is to be 
It's very difficult how to put it because saying going back to negotiations is not enough. We've proved that. There has to be goodwill. There has to be mutual respect. And there has to be also um, adherence to resolutions taken by the Security Council and not vetoing these resolutions so that they can be, you know, shielding actions that could have been taken years ago and wouldn't have been, you know, at this at this stage in this moment in time. I'm afraid that in spite of all the appeals that we've been hearing in these last days, there has been escalation. And the only the only thing I can say is that I sincerely hope that there would be intervention by authoritative organizations like the United Nations or even the Quartet. This is why I criticize the Quartet from the um, European Union and, and, and the United Nations to try to bring about some, some stability. My biggest concern is not looking at the big picture, which is the political and the security picture. It is the children, it's the civilians, it's the civilian population that is suffering. We all see pictures on our television screens with children absolutely not realizing, not knowing what's happening around them. And this is something which we have, we have to, to, to bear responsibility for and it will stay on our conscience if we don't do all we can to try to avoid such instances happening over and over again. Now, coming to the question by Mr. Langwar about the blue plan of the Mediterranean, that is something which I have to say did work, did give results for all, over all these years. But his very important question is the question of climate change and tourism. Obviously, the Mediterranean is known like the Caribbean for, for, its, uh, for, for, for the, 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 the opportunities it presents to tourists from all over the world. Now, talking about climate change, that could affect tourism in many ways than one. And I did make, um, give some indications because obviously I had to be very brief in my uh, speaking about horizontal issues. But when we're talking about climate change, the threat is for temperatures to rise. Now, if temperatures are rising, that could have an effect on the uh, flora and the fauna around the Mediterranean. It could have an effect on sea temperatures, and that would mean that even, even ocean currents that feed the, 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 um, the currents in the Mediterranean uh, will also be disturbed. It also means that there would be, that there would be also possibility of rising water levels thus affecting coastal towns. It's such a huge, such a huge thing. And to the question by Mr. Langwar, what I can reply is that we are trying in our small way, we're trying to, to do all we can to contribute towards avoiding, you know, climate change. Um, I can only say something which I was uh, very happily involved in when we were having the, the um, Chogham, the meeting of heads of states of the Commonwealth way back in 2015, it was on the eve of the Paris uh, COP21, where we actually got all the 54 Commonwealth countries together for a declaration on climate action, which was then taken by our Prime Minister to Paris to be presented to the, to the, to the COP21. Um, in, in a nutshell, what I can say is that we are trying to do all we can as far as, as, as conservation of energy, um, uh, sustainable, sustainable energies, uh, by trying to, to, to exceed as much as possible to the SDGs. Because obviously the SDGs, um, all 17 of them, you have five, six of them that are specifically specifically directed to, to, to the environment. And without them, without them, you wouldn't have uh, the others. So, because poverty depends on that, um, women's rights depend on that, you know, health, everything depends on that. So we are obviously like, like any other country, in the region, we are concerned, obviously, with, with what could happen if we don't um, uh, exceed, we don't, we, don't, we don't arrive at the control of rising temperatures, you know, definitely beyond the two degrees, and what that could mean for tourism. But I have to be honest with you, I mean, before tourism, I would be even more concerned uh, on what that would mean for our nationals, for our people. Because that is something which, which we have to, to take care of.
So um, again, and I, I'll remind you what I what I said in my in my presentation, where I actually um, attached changes in even in Africa to what would happen in the Mediterranean. Because with climate change, I was talking about water shortage, crop failure, desertification, and these are factors which would make people in those countries, in the in the Sahel and the in the in the North African countries, move north to try to find you know more temperate temperate um, uh, climates, and that would mean possibly increased uh, migration to the Mediterranean and also demographic changes, which we don't know exactly uh, which way they will go. Excellency, thank you so much. Uh, just as a sub question, if I may, uh, related to the question of Middle East, uh, just a little clarification. So, what is the impact on the on the on the talks in Vienna on on uh, uh, nuclear talks with Iran? So, apparently, that uh, now what is happening between Israel and Palestine, uh, especially in the Gaza, uh, has an impact, uh, uh, and and we see that the American administration is also. Uh, very much uh, concern about this, and uh, and secondly, uh, is it also related to the to the to the fact that uh, uh, Netanyahu um, practically lost elections, and that that might be that uh, the new Israeli government is there, and that on the other side, Palestinians are scheduling and then postponing elections, and that Hamas is trying to see its all also its own opportunity to expand politically or over the Palestinian territories? Just as a sub-question, uh, a, a well, little I comment. Wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to go into the intricacies of, of internal policies in these countries. I mean, facts we're talking about are there for everybody to see. The only, the only remarks I wanted to make was on, on the um, uh, Iran deal, which in my opinion was a very, a very, um, I didn't, it wasn't a good move by the Trump administration at the time to move out of the Iran deal. By the Iran deal, uh, the European Union and, and I would say the, the, the Western world had, to a certain extent, bound people like um, Rouhani, President Rouhani, um, to at least accept verification of what was happening in Iran. Now, I'm not an expert, I cannot say how much that was valid, but obviously, um, after all those uh, talks and, and negotiations, Everybody was happy around the table that the deal had been done. And when the United States um, withdrew from that, obviously, I'm not condoning what, what Iran did, but once the deal was not observed by one side, uh, Iran felt free to try to do that. And we have to remember that when Rouhani um, engaged himself on behalf of Iran in that deal, he was promising to the Iranian people that by doing that, there would be removal of sanctions and better economic and trade conditions for people in Iran. Obviously, when he was, um, you know, when, when the United States ret ret retreated from the treaty, obviously, people in Iran turned to us right is this the deal? What's going to happen? So that is something which, now, as far as, far as, as um, you know, the, the Netanyahu and what we're saying about his, his elections and whatnot, we have to understand that Netanyahu has, and I say this uh, in, 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 all, in all fairness, he has managed um, with the Abraham Accords to build bridges between African con um, Arab countries. And that is something which has changed to a certain extent the scenario. Now, whether that you know, gives somebody uh, a sense that he can do what is being done because the Arab countries are not going to criticize. That is something which we have to watch and we have to see. However, had this not um, happened, had this outbreak and, 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 and fighting happened, um, I, I was always in favor of seeing more and more of these Abraham Accords and more negotiations between Israel and the Arab countries, because that in itself is laying down a, a sort of a network of more diplomatic activities which could in themselves bring about more understanding, more dialogue, and hopefully, hopefully, um, rapprochement between, between the two sides. But the situation is, is very complex. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Excellency. You mentioned anyway Helsinki Accord and OSC. So OSC is also a unique platform 
not only for connecting from uh, countries from Vancouver to to Vladivostok, but also having this Mediterranean dimension and having Arabs and Israelis together. If you allow me, I've been always very, very critical of the OSC. I was, I participated in OSC during my ministerial days, but I've always been very critical that the OSC managed to bring in countries like um, Japan and like um, Korea. Korea from the other side, but they never fully integrated the North African countries. True. The North African countries who are supposed to be part of the whole security arrangement in the Mediterranean to ensure security in the European Union, because it's, it's a maxim which I talked about and which has been accepted by everybody. These remain till this very day partners for cooperation. Yes. And even in meetings, I hate to say it, in meetings they are relegated to the last speaking posts when everybody would have left, the people that matter. And sure. they are there simply because just to make numbers. I have openly criticized, and I say it with all due respect, with, with uh, Secretary General Zanieri at that time, and we discussed it, that the OSCE, in my opinion, has no Mediterranean, Mediterranean perspective. To prove this, my question is, why before the Arab Spring, why has the OSCE not at least doubted what could happen? Nobody smelt it coming with all our intelligence, with all our secret services. Nobody knew it was coming. And then even worse, once it happened, what did the OSCE do in the Mediterranean? True. And I leave the question with you. I'm not being, you know, I try to be destructive. I'm being critical because I believe in the OSCE. I believe that what, what the OSCE did in, 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 in the fragmentation that there was in Europe, um, uh, if that could have been applied to the Mediterranean, things would have been different today. But, but the OSCE is not including the partners for cooperation of today, the North African countries, as full members with council rights and speaking powers and decisions. The Mediterranean has to be acknowledged even more by the OSCE because it is an organization which could, and I still believe that it can, do something positive to reach more stability, more security, and more prosperity in the European Union, in the, in the Mediterranean. Excuse me. Uh, thank, thank you. It's an excellent point. Uh, so, uh, not to monopolize too much, uh, to open the floor again uh, to uh, yet another round of three questions, please. Don't be shy. Christian here, please. Yes, please. Thank Introduce you. Introduce yourself you. shortly and the question, please. Thank you. So, uh, Your Excellency, thank you for your time and your speech. I am Chole Madhub Konate. And uh, so, Excellency, Mr. President, due to the pandemic, uh, Africa's GDP went down by 2.1%. And this is the worst recession Africa has seen in 25 years. This recession is really acting as an accelerator of ongoing multidimensional crisis, as we can see, for instance, in Thail, as you mentioned, which means that potentially we are going to have many more people willing to cross the Mediterranean Sea, uh, seeking for a better life. To my mind, very often, there is a misconception of elements that push a candidate for migration to leave his country. The people that I'm talking about are not fleeing poverty, they are fleeing the popularization of their life and existence in an hostile, bad, and deceiving living environment. So, uh, Mr. President, don't you think that the European answer to that issue, the issue of migration, are quite a new polar or maybe naive, let's say, solution that consists in some of them in our security responses, for instance, with the new pact on migration and asylum? Thank you, Mr. President. Very good. Uh, two more questions. Yes, please. I've got one question, sir. Yes, Do please. You... Do you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, please. Talk, talk. Yes. My name is uh, Nasir Ahmad Ghaznavi. I'm from Afghanistan, from Dunya University. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, just talk, talk. I've got a question about the Middle East conflict uh, <clears throat> to the Excellency of Mr. President. Uh, as uh, he indicated uh, a few minutes ago that uh, 
Mm, Israel wants uh, peace and stability in the Middle East. And uh, example, uh, they, they, would, they would like peace and stability in the Middle East. Mm, and uh, they, uh, I, I think, uh, I think uh, Israel creates conflict in the Middle East itself, Netanyahu. Why? Because if, if do they have big problems in the Middle East with the Palestine and other Middle East countries like Syria, Iran, with Palestine, why they don't directly negotiate to the United States and a group in countries? Instead, example, killing innocent people and bomb all Palestine, as you see, uh, and here, this, uh, this uh, conflict in the Palestine and uh, between Palestine uh, and Israel. Why they don't, the United States of America don't take action directly against uh, Mr. Netanyahu because he, he is the problem in the, in the Middle East and he's creating problems, big problems in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Uh, I have a question. Please. Possible? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, plan and pro program. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your excellency. That's very deeply and very analytical uh, present. Uh, I am Mojgan Hosseini, professor of Donia University and Tehran University from Iran. I am from Iran, but I'm not now in Iran. I have some uh, questions that actually uh, someone uh, like uh, Mr. Robert uh, talk about that and you uh, all um, respond about everything. Uh, and I have uh, one question. Uh, I want to know if is it possible, uh, please uh, give me or us Iranian like me, uh, your prediction about the relationship between Iran and US uh, in the uh, future. Because my student doesn't <laughs> come to uh, this meeting <laughs> and uh, Iran doesn't allow them. And they talk to me several times, uh, um, professor, I cannot <laughs> join you. Uh, but I have a question uh, about it. It's very important for us uh, Iranian people. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. You're welcome. Let, let me start from the last um, question by uh, Ms. Hosseini. I have Thank no crystal ball and I cannot say exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I cannot make predictions, obviously, but I stand by what I said, that in 2015, there was all good intentions from both sides, including from the Iranian side, to come to some sort of agreement on the control of, uh, of um, <clears throat> the production of uh, fissionable material. Now, I have said it already, I didn't, I wasn't happy when the deal was uh, not kept by the United States side. What I can say as prediction is that I sincerely and I honestly believe that there is goodwill also from the Iranian side. And if these discussions that are going to be embarked upon are taken seriously with the new administration included by the administration, I'm sure that some sort of agreement will um, be arrived at. That's all I can say. I cannot say exactly what the relations would be, because even the Biden administration, though critical of what uh, the Trump administration did, said that they would also take the opportunity to, to, to sort of fine tune certain aspects of the agreement of 2015. In my opinion, I think that would be very, very important simply because Iran, <clears throat> and I'm saying it not because I'm speaking to you, is a very important country in the region. It's a very influential country. And I strongly believe that if there is a certain amount of, of entente between um, uh, the Western countries and Iran, it will also radiate its effect on the on the whole of even the Gulf, the Gulf region. So this is very important. And uh, as I said, though I cannot, I cannot say exactly what would happen. I strongly believe that they will they will come to some sort of agreement, uh, because because that is something very important. What I sincerely hope is that this spat between between the Western countries and Iran will not have an effect on having 
um, uh, an election of a government in Iran, which would be extremist, because that would definitely then um, throw everything out of sync and things will start um, taking a different direction. Hopefully, um, uh, moderators, people of a moderate approach like, like, like Rouhani, in my opinion, did a lot of good. And by having extremist uh, people in, in government does not do any good. As far as the question by um, our uh, Afghanistan student or interlocutor about Israel, I've said enough about Israel. The only thing I can say is that um, it's a question of not carrying on with pointing fingers, saying that's because of that, because of that. Because Everybody has got some sort and some a little uh, some amount of blame, and unless we take, you know, away our pride, sit down and agree to recognize each other as human beings, as people with human rights, as people with international rights, and start arguing from that point of departure, we will not get anywhere. So, as I said, the problem is very complex, and we always. And you rightly pointed out that the United States, I said the United States is obviously a crucial player in anything, in any decision that could that could take place um, in the future. It has been um, uh, instrumental in what has happened up to now because of, of active or passive actions. But my hope is that with passive particip with active participation, um, solutions will be found to this problem. But we have to stop pointing fingers and saying he's fully uh, responsible, the others are angels, the others are devils. I mean, there's a mixture of everything on both sides. And we have to, we have to, to go beyond the finger pointing exercise and try to start analyzing seriously what has to be done, not in the interest of Netanyahu or Abbas, in the interest of the men in the street, of the civilians and the children, which I made reference to before. Now, um, uh, the first question, because I started from, was about, was about, well, I must say it was about Africa. Now, I have to admit, Africa is, is uh, not Malta. It's, we're talking about a whole continent. We're talking about 55 countries, 54 countries. We're talking about a uh, population of billions and of problems which have not surfaced yesterday. These have been there, you know, ages. I have to admit, as a European, that a lot of blame can be put on the shoulders of countries that have colonized countries in, in Africa. This is history, and we have to admit it. Unfortunately, um, uh, many conflicts and many issues can be traced back to those, to those years. However, we cannot just stop by you know, looking back and not doing anything. Africa is, first of all, a challenge, but at the same time, as we're looking at it at the moment, even from the European Union side, um, as an opportunity. There are so many resources, both mineral resources, human resources, that can be, can be um, uh, organized to give positive results. Now, one of the things I've always believed in is a part from, because when we speak about Africa, it's migration. And uh, that is the most visible part that we see. However, there are many questions that we can, we can pose ourselves and say, but what are we doing to increase investment in Africa? What are we doing to increase importation from Africa? What are we doing to educate the people in Africa? What are we doing to give better chances to youth in Africa? And this is where, where this is the, the question which um, intrigues me the most, the issue of young people in African countries. And I strongly believe that we can argue as much as we can about controlling illegal migration. But we have to admit that we have somehow, it's my belief, we have to provide some legal channels of migration for young people in Africa to come to the European Union. I always believed in what I call circular migration. Not coming to stay, because that would create a brain drain in the African countries themselves. Because the best and the most 
um, daring would leave, the others would just stay behind. That is not doing a service to these African countries. In my opinion, there could be a circle migration in the sense that um, young people could be given the chance to spend two, three, four years in the European Union, learning trades, doing some business, earning some money, educating themselves, but then going back to their own countries to invest what would they would have learned and earned into their own economies. We already have the Blue Card Directive, which you know, is not perfect, but um, recently there has been talk about, about um, making it better and, and more available to young people coming from, from, from Africa. I've also always spoke about the, what I used to call the Erasmus Plus sort of program, through which young people from African countries just apply and are accepted to come to the European Union. So there are many things that could be done, but it's not an easy situation. It is a, a, a huge, a huge challenge. Um, obviously, everything depends on stability, because if there's no stability, one should not expect investment to take place in African countries. Certain countries, obviously, um, we, we cannot speak, you know, in general terms on all the countries of, the, of, of Africa. Certain countries are doing really well and they are doing uh, giving, giving the impression that they now have taken up um, democratic uh, systems and, and uh, functioning, but we cannot say that for all the countries. And unfortunately, what happens is that if there is um, um, instability in one country, it normally sort of, you know, goes into the adjoining countries. We all know about the instability, for example, and I made reference to it, to the Sahel, starting from Mauritania, carrying on to Chad to, to, to Mali to, to Somalia. These are, these are unfortunately, um, uh, this is unfortunately what is happening in African countries. But I strongly believe that we have, we have to, to dedicate a lot of attention to, as I'm saying, giving the chance for people from Africa to, to come to the European Union, to learn trades, to learn to educate themselves. But then, as I said, going back to do, to, to apply what they would have learned to their own countries. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, thank you. So now we will go for the for the uh, next or the last round of, of three questions. Uh, we have, I think, charming ladies already waiting. But I would like to I would like to uh, uh, say hello to our friend uh, Moroccan ambassador, and he indicated just a, a little reference. So, with um, due respect to all of you, so let's uh, let's hear ambassador of Morocco. Just with a few words. Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Professor Anis. And uh, we don't see you, but doesn't matter. So I we hear you. I don't know how to use my camera. <laughs> it's okay. But uh, anyhow, I will try to do it later, maybe. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank you for organizing this uh, this important uh, webinar and uh, giving us the possibility to interact. Uh, with the Honorable President of Malta on subject uh, of uh, common interest. Uh, I would like, uh, I do fully agree with, uh, with, uh, with the Honorable President about uh, the importance to associate North African countries with the process of the, of the OCE. Uh, we are, as Morocco, as far as we are concerned, we have this status as a partner for cooperation, Mediterranean partner for cooperation. Uh, which, uh, as you may know, it was adopted during Bratislava meeting in 2019. It was just a contact group. Now we have this upgrade, if I can say, uh, status. And I think that we could play a role in, in some, some important thematic uh, discussed within OCE. Uh, in, but we have only one conference in the Mediterranean conference. I think it's not enough. And uh, we could, as Mediterranean countries, you know, within OCE, uh, to uphold and to enhance our dialogue on some uh, political specific issues uh, of common interest, like migration, like security, like terrorism. And we think that we have our experience, I mean, the, uh, the both shore of Mediterranean, and we could uh, contribute to the international uh, debate on, 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 on such thematic 
in other fora, not only in OCE. And we can we can elaborate one 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 kind of position on some some subjects. You know, uh, terrorism is is a, is an issue which uh, which is debated in UN. We have UN strategy on on terrorism. We have it is also uh, considered by OCE. It is considered by UNDC. But we, 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 I think that we have a lack of convergence of view between all the international organizations. And it is our duty as, uh, as, uh, as OCE partner corporations to create this dynamic of, and also this synergy between all, all the organizations by expressing our views uh, and also defending our position. Uh, no, 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 you know, no, no, no. Uh, as uh, as a Mediterranean country, and we, have, we have the honor to, to chair the six committee, uh, UN six committee, we were able to adopt this convention on, 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 on terrorism. I mean, the convention of the suppression of illicit act uh, against nuclear terrorism uh, in 2006. It was not an easy task, but we believe that as Mediterranean country, we could we could uh, participate to the international debate by make, making some concrete proposal, uh, especially on the issue that, uh, you know, it's very important, this migration. And uh, I think that we are all suffering migration and we have this humanitarian dimension of migration, which is not uh, considered uh, by, 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 uh, by, by some countries. And we think that we have this responsibility as uh, Mediterranean partner corporation to, to consider this issue in all its dimension to find a solution. It's one of the issue of common interest. And I think that OCE uh, could play a role uh, by advancing the debate on migration in way of implementing this international compact, which was adopted two years ago in Marrakesh uh, by, uh, by setting up many objectives to attend and to, to achieve. Thank you so much, Professor Anis. Excellency Ambassador, thank you so much. Uh, so I think we should go uh, with the two other questions. I think Ms. Rita, the Minister Advisor, she wants to, 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 to put the question. Yes, please. Um, react to um, how um, can I just react uh, before we proceed to what the... Um, yes, please, please, please. I agree completely with what he was saying, and I'm sure that um, the OSCE under Helga Schmidt now could even, you know, embark on, you know, other initiatives. I have to say that our experience with Morocco, and I'm saying this um, honestly, has always been very positive, especially uh, in the five plus five format. And the facts speak for themselves because we all know that Morocco has the best of relationships with the European Union to the extent that, I mean, there are certain concessions, certain agreements, which only Morocco enjoys with the European Union. So, um, uh, while uh, agreeing completely with what he was saying, I have to say that Moroccan Moroccan diplomats and even parliamentarians have given a very, a very um, um, big contribution to all the discussions that we've been having in the Mediterranean, um, both in uh, the 5 plus 5, as well, why not, even in the OSCE, but as I said, treating them as sort of lesser equals and not as uh, equal to, to others. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rita, uh, finally. Excellency. Um, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Rita Nwari from Australia, from Queensland. Um, my question is uh, from Excellency. Is, um, as we know, uh, four weeks ago, we um, all around the world, uh, we heard the news to um, Excellency Joe Biden uh, he decided to talk the truth and from Afghanistan. Uh, I want to hear from Excellency um, how responsible his decision was. Can you hear me? No, I'm not understanding. It's muffled, very muffled. Okay, is that clear now? Is that clear? No, repeat the last sentence, last sentence, which was the uh, question. My Okay, my question is, um, uh, four weeks ago, um, all around the world, um, 
um, um, Excellency and Joe Biden um, made the decision to take the troop out of Afghanistan. And we, as the Afghan all around the world, we feel like it was um, kind of uh, unresponsible to do that act to before um, the um, Dashi or Taliban, um, you know, out of this um, problem in Afghanistan. But um, uh, what is a vision for that for these decision? Is that a responsible decision? If it is, is uh, from which angle do you think? But if it is not, what we can do to raise this question as the United Nations to get more support. As I know myself, uh, Malta has got so much respect for women, as uh, he, um, uh, Malta actually believes women rights as human rights. So um, again, uh, women is the future world, um, where would we stay? And what Malta can do to help Afghan women in the future might be after the September. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Isabel, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Isabel, you, you wanted a question. Yes, thank you. Yes, please. I just want to, yeah. Thank you, Mr. President, for your time. I'm Isabella Bello, and I just wanted to ask you really quickly about what you were mentioning before about the environment and the SDGs. And I just wanted to ask, do you believe that the SDGs are designed, as they are designed right now, are attainable for all countries? Or do you believe that these goals should be adapted to the changing need oh, of the uh, most, so more? So fast, please. <laughs> Speak slowly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you believe that uh, the SDGs, as they are designed right now, work for all countries, or if they should be changed and adapted to the ever-changing needs of the most developing countries in general? And additionally, do you believe that there may be any trade-offs for Malta in uh, trying to achieve the environmental SDGs with such... Um, um, so so quickly and so fast. Thank you. <clears throat> Is this the last question? Okay, so um, let me start with Ms. Rita talking about what Biden was saying, the Taliban situation in Afghanistan again. Um, whether it's responsible or not, I mean, in diplomatic circles, we don't sort of, again, we don't point fingers and say this is irresponsible or this is responsible. We analyze. And we try, we try to, to see the better part of each argument. Then we can criticize without being destructive. Now, the question also carried on by saying, what will Malta do? Malta, as I said, Malta cannot do much, um, uh, apart from the fact that we're not in the, in the same geographical um, region. However, I have to, I have to, to uh, remind everybody that Malta is, is um, trying to get elected for a non-permanent seat in the Security Council for the years 23, 24. The elections will take place a year before, obviously. And it is through, through positions like that, that Malta will be in a position to speak and to talk uh, about the policies that we have. We can do it, obviously. We do it in all, in all four that, 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 that we attend. Um, we believe very strongly in multilateralism because we believe that countries like Malta small as we are, will be practically irrelevant where we're not forming parts of organizations like what we're talking about, Council of Europe, OSCE, uh, UN, obviously. So multilateralism is uh, a way of projecting ourselves. In cases like Taliban, as I said, I mean, we will be in a position, obviously, to, uh, to, to, to say what we have to say and to, to, to air our views on such issues which are you know, farther away from our region, only through these structures. As a matter of fact, we have managed to do that on um, countries and other regions like, like, like Asia, when we became members of ASEAN. Um, and we have regular meetings with, with uh, other countries, colleagues from, from the um, Asian region, where we can obviously exchange experiences and get to know much more about their problems in their, in their part of the world. As far as the, as the uh, last question with, from Isabel about the environment and, and the SDGs, um, if I were to be asked hand on heart whether the SDGs would be achieved by 2030, I would not definitely bet anything on that because it is not an easy, it's not an easy objective. Well, as I said, there are 17 objectives. Um, one could say not all of them will be achieved. I would say that many of them will not be achieved. 
And this is an exercise which has taken place way back since 2000. I remember in the beginning there were the millennium, millennium goals, which then um, everybody realized that we are not in time to achieve them. Then there was a rethinking and, 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 and eventually we ended up with the, with, the, with the SDGs, which are a much smaller number of objectives, but more targeted. Obviously, 2030 is, what, nine, nine years from now. And when we look at the objectives, especially when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, pollution and, and, and global temperatures, it is a mammoth task. The only thing that one can say is that one cannot lose heart and say, let's stop, don't do anything. We, we will keep on trying to achieve the objectives. And hopefully by the time we get to 2030, we would have achieved, if not all the objectives or 100% or, or of the target would be at least 70%, 80%, but we will be always walking and moving in the, in the direction towards achieving these objectives. Uh, thank you, Excellency. I think uh, uh, we are coming to a close. Uh, I see that there are at least 10, 15 questions more, which convinces <laughs> us once more that we have to invite you, Mr. Ex uh, uh, Mr. President, soon to Geneva physically. Physically, and, uh, much, uh, it would be much better. Yes, UMF, UMF has uh, moved from the center of the city into a beautiful chateau. And uh, on behalf of uh, uh, university president or rector, uh, and all uh, fellow colleagues, I would uh, uh, all heartedly invite you and your team to visit us at the first uh, possible occasion, uh, because it's really a beautiful place to be uh, in Geneva. And uh, with this word, I want to thank you so much for your time. We know that you have a very, very busy schedule. It was uh, comprehensive. It was uh, uh, thought uh, inspiring. And it was very, uh, let's say, uh, uh, far-sighted, everything that you said. And I'm sure that uh, our fellows would be inspired not only to study security, but also to visit Malta, to study and live in Malta for a semester, and also to follow issues of the small and island countries and uh, of EU and of course of Mediterranean. So thank you so much, Excellency. Uh, for this great and uh, uh, rare pleasure and honor. And uh, we wish you all of the very best to your country, to people of Malta, and to you and your family. Stay healthy and uh, very productive as you are. Thank you very much for these closing words. I thank you once again for having me, for inviting me to for this very interesting opportunity. And I also like to thank each and every one of the participants for their patience and listening to me and at the same time also engaging in questions which um, I found very, very interesting. I wish you all the best in, their in your studies. And as you rightly said, uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, in Malta uh, enjoying some, some sunshine and, and clear blue seas. So thank you very much once again. Thank you. We think differently. 